about the, mis the, the machines that accept themselves problem <coughs> that makes this work where you can apply a general Turing. A general Turing machine can analyze a bounded Turing machine and turn something that would normally be undecidable or recursively enumerable into something that is decidable. Or can, it seems like that would be the case with anything, like any of those uh, categorizing Turing machines. Problems. It's true. And any now we know when it loops. Right, but, but just like any diagonalization, any time you add a little power so that the higher level can understand the lower level, there's a question about that higher level that it can't figure out about itself. And you can add in a little more power. But, but this, that, this same thing could apply to lots of other sure. Turing machine analysis problems other than just for those that accept themselves, right? I mean. Oh, oh, oh. In fact, it does, right. Right, right, right. Oh, I see. Um, is the set of all S of N bounded Turing machines uh, an, an empty language? Right. All those things, right. You can, you can apply Rice's theorem ideas to things like this, sure. Um, all right, so there's a time hierarchy theorem that's very much like this. What I want to do just to maybe to, to finish up today is talk maybe five, ten minutes about alternation, uh, give you some general sense about what those results are, where it fits in in our big bullseye picture. And tomorrow slash Friday, <coughs> we have a couple more days, um, I'll try to <coughs> set up a lecture about the recursion theorem, about programs that output themselves. And perhaps, <coughs> maybe in recitation today, I'll have Dimitri do some reductions, which I think will help you with problem sets, and then go over other questions on the problem set. So just another five minutes here about alternation. <coughs> P, NP, P space. Let's get a real piece of chalk. Okay. All right. I mentioned this idea of an alternating Turing machine the other day. And I'm going to remind you what it is. An alternating Turing machine has two kinds of states. States that are OR states and states that are AND states. A non-deterministic Turing machine, all the states are OR states. That's the best way to understand an alternating Turing machine is in terms of generalizing a non-deterministic Turing machine. A regular deterministic Turing machine, you have one choice out of every state given a symbol on the tape, given a state in the machine. A non-deterministic Turing machine can have many choices. But we interpret the acceptance of that as if it was an or. If this one, or this one, or this one, or this one works out and accepts, then I accept. So every state in that non-deterministic machine is an or state. You can define and states. So that then, when there are many choices out of that state, the acceptance idea is that they all have to end up going to accepting configurations before you accept. And if they go to or states, then there just has to be one of those computations from there that has to work. And if that goes to an AND state, all the arrows out have to end up in accepting configurations. So it's more complicated to decide whether you accept something or not, but your machine is kind of really powerful. And it gives you this alternating quantification that lets you write algorithms very, very quickly. And as I mentioned once before, there are many times where you can think of an alternating algorithm that solves a problem right away, even though the polynomial time algorithm is a little bit elusive. For example, there was a problem that I worked on a long, long time ago that there's an n to the fifth polynomial time algorithm for it. And you just don't think of it, given the problem straight up, even though the alternating idea is readily apparent. And it's, it's an algorithm about figuring out how to take different graphs and put them on top of trees so as to minimize certain distances of the edges that are spread out in the trees. It's called an embedding problem. And it's an alternating thing because you spread out over the trees for every there exists, for every there exists, uh, without getting into details. Th there are problems like that. So alternation is kind of a nice idea to think about. What's even nicer about it theoretically is that these alternating classes fit in with the diagrams we have here. And I gave this to you last time. I'm going to tell you again. Polynomial time turns out to be the same as alternating space log n. That means you have an alternating Turing machine that uses log n space. That's the same as a polynomial time algorithm. Polynomial space 
is a time polynomial. If you have an alternating machine and you let it run in polynomial time, that is exactly the same as the things you can do in polynomial space. So this is interesting. Think about polynomial time being here and this saying, I'm adding alternation to polynomial time. When you add alternation, when you add non-determinism to polynomial time, it pops you up here. That's adding there exists. When you add universal, when you make it alternating, it pops you up the next level. Precisely. That's a very beautiful result. Add one quantifier, you're here. Add two quantifiers, you're here. Questions? All right. This is also a nice result, but it goes in the other way. Take space. Remember d space log n that was inside here, the, the most inner circle in the smaller picture before? Take d space log n and take it out of deterministic Turing machine land and turn it into alternating Turing machine land, and it bumps you up two levels to polynomial time. It's completely a dual situation. Add things to the space, and it bumps you up two levels. Add things to the time, and it bumps you up two levels. It's a really nice result that these classes completely coincide. No strange overlaps, just completely coincide. What about this, way up here? <coughs> What if you have exponential time? What is that going to be equal to? A space of what? What do you think? Let's take a guess. Well, I need a function here, not a complexity class, right? So here, when I added log n to my A space, I got polynomial time. So if I add 2 to the log n, I would get 2 to the polynomial time, hopefully. So that's what happens. Polynomial space with alternation gives you exponential time. This is really the same idea as this. It's just lifted up at a higher level. These two are the same. But this is very, very nice. Now, the proofs of these things are not terrible, but they're also not simple. I mean, they really need a whole class or a class and a half. Uh, Mike Sipser's book has these proofs. He splits it into three or four lemmas each. But the idea intuitively, and I'll just give you a, a two-minute overview of this proof, because it's really not so bad. The idea is that you need to figure out how to simulate alternating machines that use log n space in polynomial time. So you, somebody gives you an alternating machine, and you've got to simulate it somehow. So here's the alternating machine. It looks like this. Here's the computation. If it was a non-deterministic machine, you just have to find out if there's a path from here to here. But if it's an alternating machine, you have to find a subtree, a single branch on the existential and all the branches on the universal. A single branch on the existential, all the branches on the universal. You have to find a subtree of this tree that ends up ending with leaves that are all configurations. And the question is, how long does it take to find a subtree of a given tree if every one of these nodes takes at most log n space? And if you do the brute force, run through the tree, you don't get polynomial time. But it turns out you can turn this tree into a graph called an and-or graph. And traversing that and-or graph is like working through directed acyclic graphs and finding a topological order, and working your way back, computing the ands and ors, and when you're all done, it ends up taking only polynomial time. All right, that's a 45-second version of what really needs an hour to completely understand. But at least vaguely, you get an idea that it's a simulation whose first attempt doesn't work, but if you collapse the data structure in a clever way and go back to some stuff in algorithms, you can make it work in polynomial time. And all these simulations, end up being things that go back to graph theory and algorithms. They don't lie so much in the weird world of like infinity, what Dimitri talked about yesterday. They lie in the world of practical, can you figure out how to simulate one data structure more efficiently with another? So this stuff is not always just pure mathematics. It comes back to stuff that relates to programming, even in this back way. All right, so I want you to know these results, because they're really cool, and it's really beautiful, and you should see them. We won't have enough time.